Uh, good morning, and thank you for attending this uh, morning session and listening to our small group. Uh, to start, we, we are three individuals that are currently enrolled in either the Global Security or Strategic Intelligence Doctorate Program at the American Military University. As a team, we're going to be discussing growth of Chinese space assets and the Sino-Russian uh, cooperation. At the end of the three presentations, we'll stand by and answer any questions you may have about our individual presentations. First, we'll have my presentation, uh, which is a wavetop dissection of how China is recreating the South China Sea playbook in space under a neo-realistic leader. And then we're going to move into Sean Ken Henderson, who is an amazingly talented student with a distinct Chinese background, who will go into Chinese source documents to, to further explain the Chinese space program. Uh, and then we'll finalize, uh, finish it out with uh, Kent Strader. He's a second year doctoral student in global security at AMU. His research interests include Arctic security, Russia, and NATO. And he served over 28 years in uniform, both as an infantry officer and army strategist, retiring as an army colonel in 2020. Uh, for the past two and a half years, he's worked in Saudi Arabia as a defense contract and senior military advisor. And he's a graduate of the NATO Defense College in the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies, earning his master's in military art and science. As we get started on this journey again, I am Adam Navin. I'm a student with the Global Security Program, and I'll attempt to lay the groundwork for the other two gentlemen and get everyone at least on the same page of understanding so we're not losing anybody. As we begin, this presentation is a literature review of open source academia and media sources looking at China's space priority as based on President Xi's goals and intents, as well as using the South China Sea as a case study playbook for how China operates. President Xi's own stated goal is to make China the foremost space power by 2045. As we look into the agenda, there's going to be four primary areas. It's going to be President Xi Jinping as a leader, uh, the South China Sea terraforming case study. We'll briefly touch on some Chinese space assets, and then I'll close out with some gaps and assumptions to, to prepare us for what we do and don't know. It starts all with the, the Xi dynasty. So the former Qing dynasty was formed through years of economic growth and violent expansion. Ultimately, towards the end of the 19th century and start of the 20th century, the Qing dynasty began losing ground. The green areas in the north became more free and independent. The areas in the south outlined in red were lost to other foreign countries. And on the far right or the eastern edge of the image, Taiwan, Korea, and Manchuria were lost to wars with Japan, which China still feels jaded over. When Xi Jinping first took power in 2012, he set to grab the baton of his predecessors to accelerate growth for the great, his great nation. As the power went from collective to leader, Xi began a dynasty move. In his words at his first press conference, he stated he wanted to achieve the renewal of the great nation. At first glance, he has been quite successful growing Chinese economy uh, economically and globally. Internally, Xi is a mass power through an anti-corruption program aimed at rooting out his competition and consolidating power through him. Xi has continued the Leninist party of the KMT and expanded the powers of the CCP or the uh, Communist Chinese political party and himself to advance the growth of China. Shortly after Xi's rise to the preeminent leader, the One Belt, One Road initiative was started and is tied in over 68 countries. In a neo-Marxist role, China has created a debt trap for at least eight developing countries as they fail to be able to pay the loan for the OBOR. In other cases, such as Sri Lanka and Tajikistan, they've either long-term relinquished ports or completely relinquished territory back to China, as is the latter case, to settle the, the debt. The OBOR is one way that China has developed both globally and economically under neoliberal perspective. On a different tangent, is the standing on Chinese laws and the understanding of dual-use technology. The two laws of most interest are the national security law and the cybersecurity law. National security law, or the national intelligence law of the People's Republic of 2017, specifically Article 7, highlights the direct support of all personnel and companies in cooperation with state intelligence, which infers that all Chinese nationals shall directly and indirectly work through and for the government under the guise of national security. Article 28 of the cybersecurity law mandates that all telecommunications companies must provide support and assistance to the state, providing vague language, which leads the global security network to assess this as a direct subordination for all telecommunications to the CCP. 
Additional articles continue with the direct communication between the two, leaving a lacuna in understanding. Couple these with the CCP's military civil fusion, which attempts to make the cooperation a gray area legally. And there's a recipe for China to exploit the uh, global community at the peril uh, of everyone else. Closing out the future path for Xi, China, amongst other countries, focuses their efforts on the use of this, this dual use technology, which the Department of Defense defines as the use of a technology that has both military utility and sufficient, sufficient commercial potential to support a viable industrial base. So as we get into this uh, South China Sea terraforming case study, China claims that all terraforming projects uh, were meant to improve the livelihood of the individuals on the islands, even though many of the islands at the, at the start were strictly reefs uh, and were uninhabitable. On 6 May 2016, the Hague was set to rule on a Philippine lawsuit against China's South China Sea's actions. Uh, and the foreign affairs spokesperson, Long Hong Li, uh, emphasized that all actions in the South China Sea were strictly following the principles of conducting green projects and building ecological islands and reefs. This is all disputed by the islands in the region, namely Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Taiwan, who also claim ownership and rights over the islands in the area, as depicted by the overlapping lines in the image. Under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS, each country should have unabated access through these economic exclusion zones or EEZs uh, without notification of military movements, which China disputes. China disputes the claim, stating that the UNCLOS not only gives China the right to monitor and regulate economic uh, actions out to 200 miles from their, their claimant area, they're also able to regulate military actions past the 12-mile territorial watermark, which everyone else follows. Uh, China's opinion is, is one of a minority opinion. Considering that previous information about dual-use technology, how civilian companies are inherently predisposed to support the state in the wide range of the EEZ, even from the coastline of China, the potential for any acknowledgement of these rights extends China's ability to counter U.S. and neighboring countries' uh, oceanic transit, as well as push military assets further out past the first island chain and the second island chain and beyond. The first and second island chains are a theorized portion of the overall A2AD or anti-access area denial capability China wants to possess. The island chains are viewed differently by many individuals, with the vast majority using the first image uh, showing the first island chain and even a minority proposing the view of adding the fourth and fifth island chain. After the, the growth associated with the One Belt, One Road, uh, Chinese perspective believes that the Island chains follow an offensive approach for them. Uh, the growth of the chains represents hurdles for China being able to expand and using each of the lines as steps towards growth. Uh, conversely, the Department of Defense and the U.S. government sees these as demarcation lines or lines of advance that China will use to ad advocate for the ad action in defense. As depicted in the image on the right, uh, the terraformed reefs, uh, which are now considered islands, have grown in substantial magnitude, enabling everything from radars to missiles and aircraft, allowing a distinct extended range past the coast for China. Additionally, U.S. military reporting uh, that these assets involved are designed for anti-ship, anti-aircraft, as well as laser and jamming equipment, providing distinct standoff capabilities. As of 26 June 2023 of this year, estimates are that 27 different outposts have been constructed throughout the Paracel and Spratly Islands. As discussed, each of these new additions to what China considers their territory quickly have been become militarized and allow for the advance, uh, advancement of military and power projection. If we take this case study and President Xi's neorealistic, unabashed mindset, and throw that up in space, what assets do each does, does China have that can cause that same amount? Of disruption and concern. We're going to start with the Shijian or the SJ-21 OSAM. Uh, the, the SJ-21 is advertised as China's second on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing satellite used for repairs, debris removal, and the graveyard movement of off-orbit satellites. The geosynchronous orbit or the geo orbit uses potential parking spots where satellites can loiter as geo allows satellites to remain in a relatively stable position. Each of these parking spots is tracked by the International Telecommunication Union, which is supposed to police the systems over frequency balancing and relative distances. 
As of August 2022, there were 539 active satellites out of an estimated 1,800 available noted in 2000. Some examples of U.S. assets in GEO are the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's GOES satellite, which are their geostationary operational environmental satellite, and the United States Space Force's Advanced Extremely High Frequency System, uh, and that's the A AEHFS system for Space Force is a network of jam-resistant communications supporting uh, the joint services using the high-priority military ground, sea, and air assets. In 2022, the SJ-21 successfully docked with an outdated Beidou G2 satellite, uh, navigation satellite, before using a nearby Apogee kick motor to move it 2,700 kilometers past the typical graveyard or orbit. Uh, for note, typical graveyard or orbit is 300 kilometers past geo, and this was noted as uh, unusually large. This move made uh, China the second country after the U.S. to be able to perform such a highly sophisticated rendezvous and proximity operations, or RPOs. While the military threat of RPO and robotic arms is not its only use, it is of the utmost concern with the proximity of other satellites and the non-infinite parking in GEO. Move on to the TZ-1 or the Tanju-1. The, the, in 2016, China entered a small group of enterprises capable of refueling satellites in orbit when the uh, TY-1 system, made, uh, with the TY-1 system not, not shown here, making it possible to both extend the shelf life of satellites, but also mitigating the amount of space to debris from dying satellites. Since then, the following TZ-1 vehicle completed a second in-space refueling operation. While both systems were put into low or Earth orbit, the U.S. wants to be able to get a refueling payload out to the geo orbit by 2025. Available options with in-space refueling are not limited anymore by payload size or through maneuver versus fuel consumption. LEO houses systems ranging from telecommunications to SpaceX to our International Space Station. Residing in between LEO and GEO is the medium Earth orbit where GPS, GLONASS, and Beidou reside, making both the SJ-1 and TZ-1 with follow-on systems a threat to U.S. satellites and precision, navigation, and timing used with GPS. The JILIN-1 is a, or JL-1, is listed as a remote sensing constellation with 54 operational satellites in space, uh, with an estimated 140 that are supposed to be up by the end of the year and more than 300 by 2025 if we're following along with the China's 14th five-year plan. Processing of the high optic resolution imagery through the Chinese network system has been reduced from hours down to four minutes with imaging going to processing, identifying, dissemination. Additionally, the constellations in the Jilin network can conduct video capture, wide area, and multispectral imaging to identify wide swaths of land more accurately than any other remote sensing optical satellites. China advertises the JL-1 as a data-rich supporting satellite offering insight into the agricultural, environmental protection, and urban planning, among other economic resources, according to Changguang Satellite Technology Company Deputy Manager. This mission, though, can have nefarious outcomes when piggybacked on the knowledge that China has began large-scale purchases of farming land near military bases housing some of the United States military's most sensitive items. And the use of their fishing enterprise as part of their military surveillance and notification enterprise in the East and South China Seas. By defending their actions as part of civilian economic support, these actions can be considered non-military in nature, while at the same time using key capabilities to simultaneously conduct intelligence gathering. The Chinese began their journey towards the Tiangong Space Station in 1999. In 2011, the United States and partners of the ISS ruled that China would not be able to participate in the ISS due to security concerns on behalf of the CCP. Now, China touts that there will be 17 different countries supporting 23 experiments on board the Tiangong, or what they call the Heavenly Palace, but, this does, but they do not uh, openly discuss the fact that Taikonauts will be the primary crew aboard the space station, and it has the potential to convert many of its resources for military use. Though this is one-sided, China can make great strides towards economic growth if looking through a more constructivist lens. China's Tiangong space station is the will be the only space station in orbit starting in 2030, or as potentially as soon as 2024, as the ISS is scheduled to sunset. 
This again poses huge security concerns considering Chinese intelligence law and cybersecurity laws discussed at the onset of this discussion. Additionally, there's evidence that China delays the information that comes out of their space exploration to include lunar and Mars explorations. While these systems are not all inclusive, they represent some of the most known and more viable threats. The list may in fact be much longer to include systems not recorded here. Additionally, it's only prudent to highlight some of the gaps and assumptions that were found during research this topic. Uh, for instance, uh, what are China's intentions in space? If we're following the Chinese white paper and 14th five-year plan, uh, the, the state will assume sta space dominance before 2050 while making Chinese the preeminent authority. If we look at previous state references and milestones noted in those documents, it's with a high probability that everything China has stated will likely happen pending large unplanned obstacles such as another pandemic, global conflicts surpassing their current status, and or even the Chinese realty situation. Second, will President Xi continue his aggressive yet vague program for expansion in all domains in pursuit of his dreams? If we're looking at the previous statement, it's a high probability that what Xi states he will do and he will follow through on. Our two main key assumptions that were used are that the CCP uses dual use technology in almost all avenues to support their military and that the end goal of the CCP is to dominate the space dimension, surpassing both their near peers in US and in Russia. So where we would normally have questions, I'm gonna prep you guys for uh, Ken Henderson, who's gonna go a little bit more in depth on these Chinese systems. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Reaper. Um, so I am Sean Henderson, uh, also known as Ken. So aloha and good morning from Hawaii. Uh, good afternoon to those of you that are on East Coast time. Um, so I'm gonna keep things rolling in the China direction with my presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen from, with you at this point in time. share okay, screen sharing okay all right so i should be up um i'm assuming that everything is good and up okay all right so uh title for today is going to be china's bid for the stars so um essentially the chinese communist party is building an all-weather real-time information system using satellite technology uh, they're placing these assets strategically in support of the uh, Chinese dream in order to take its place as a world leader. Um, they're continuing to develop their satellite technology industry in support of future endeavors, both militarily and economically. So on the agenda, we're going to be discussing the goals of the Chinese Communist Party. After that, we'll roll into the background of Chinese navigational satellites, uh, we'll go into the current Beidou navigational system, um, and then we'll discuss the future of Chinese satellite technology. Uh, so first, going over the Chinese dream or the Zhongguo Meng. So uh, Chinese state nationalism is redefining China to create a socially, ethnically, and ideologically homogenous community. Uh, for the lens of constructivist theory, uh, China is utilizing state nationalism to project what China actually wants to be, um, which is a, a powerful country with the ability to protect their own interests and to support their claims on an international level. Um, this also posits China as a, a savior and a supporter, particularly of developing countries. Uh, social identity theory can be used to understand that China's dreams appeal to people's emotions. Uh, it states that China is willing to help with any um, regional or international issues uh, regarding developing countries. And it also puts forth that China is working for equal prosperity, um, not just for the Chinese people, but for everyone. Uh, one of the core tenets of the China dream is that as a great power, uh, the Chinese people have a responsibility to advocate for those that are less capable because it will benefit them and also China as well. Uh, they use the term shuang uh, ying to describe this a lot, which basically means double win. So it emphasizes that both sides will benefit from this arrangement, um, and it will also benefit from China taking its rightful place in world politics. Um, so while it's exposing that to the outside, they also still recognize the importance of domestic support. 
uh, nationalistic goals and the promotion of them have been very effective in China. Um, more Chinese people have been advocating for the protection of Chinese interests internationally to counter U.S. influence and also to further Chinese capabilities as well as prestige. So China is utilizing satellite technology to revise the national strategy and pursue global information dominance in support of both military and economic objectives. Uh, they're using their advances in Chinese satellite technology to show how powerful they are, uh, position themselves as perceived saviors of developing countries by offering services to them free of charge, and also ostensibly creating that win-win situation where both nations will profit. Uh, this feeds into the Chinese dream of taking their rightful place as a world leader, while also safeguarding their interests at home and what they consider their sovereign territory, including the South China Seas. So that moves us into the Belt and Road Initiative. So the Belt and Road Initiative, um, they say that it is a modern recreation of the Chinese Silk Road, but to be absolutely honest, that is just a, a really beautiful piece of propaganda that tries to give them a little bit of ownership of it. Um, it's really actually far, far more wide reaching than the original Chinese Silk Road. Um, when the uh, BRI started, um, it consisted of 65 countries consisting of 62% of the world population, uh, representing about 30% of the global GDP. The stated goal of the BRI is, of course, to outreach to other nations, but also to help underdeveloped countries prosper. Um, of particular importance is the South China Seas, as up to 40% of the world trade goes through that area. It also provides military resources and locations. It provides connection with other international partners. It allows projection of power. And it also strengthens China's ability to exercise jurisdiction over locations in the route, particularly in the South China Seas. Um, also, just having this and being in charge of it increases the prestige of China on the international stage. Um, it does, however, require control of the South China Seas. In claiming the South China Seas, China has been using military exercises as well as emphasizing what they term um, active defense, of which informatization and the use of satellites is a key part in tracking other countries' ships and military power. Um, additionally, they have actually been harassing other countries as well, such as the Philippines, Vietnam, and others by utilizing lasers and water cannons to harass ships and fishermen. And they're stating that they're actively protecting their sovereign territory. Um, concerns that is that China is uh, overlooking hazards in the construction of the route. And there's also fears that China is consolidating power. Uh, China has been overlooking environmental hazards and supporting the buildings, bases, and routes along the BRI to the benefit of large corporations that have invested in this initiative. Um, an example of this would be uh, Chinese companies not following green building policies implemented in China at the expense of host countries. Um, also, as uh, Reaper alluded to, some of the, uh, let's say, dicey loans and investments that they've made to other countries and then pulling them back. Um, there are also international concerns that China is attempting to control the South China Seas and position themselves as a dominant global power. Um, also that they can use surveillance technology and military threats that are augmented by satellite technology. So with that in mind, um, satellites are obviously an important part of their plan. So when and why did satellites become so important to China? And to that, we have to look to past lessons. So the impetus for improvement. Um, in 1996, the third Taiwanese Strait Crisis was occurring. And China was dependent on American satellites for GPS and navigation. They essentially rented bandwidth on our satellites. Um, as a result, uh, during this crisis, they were unable to track two U.S. carrier groups that were transiting the Taiwanese Strait because we just denied them access. They also attempted to fire three missiles as a warning signal to Taiwan. Of those three, they lost signal for two of them and have no idea where they went. Uh, one of them landed about 18 and a half kilometers from uh, Taiwan's Keelung military base, just you know, in the ocean. Um, 
a Chinese colonel said that the displays of power that they attempted were shameful and humiliating to the Chinese. So as a result, China speeded up construction on building their own navigational satellites so they wouldn't be dependent on any other nation's assets after that point. So that brings us to Beidou version one. Um, first began transmitting in 2000, and it consisted of three satellites that are currently retired. Um, the weakness is that it required active use of GPS targeting. So when you're targeting things uh, for you know missile strikes or anything like that, generally you need a four satellites minimum for passive GPS. So since there were only three satellites, uh, users had to be active in the system to actually launch, meaning that they would reveal the target location. Um, ostensibly, this was for civilian use and supporting road traffic, rail transport, and offshore operations. But obviously, these do have military uses as well. Beto version 2 uh, began transmitting in uh, 27 December of 2012. Um, so it's a total of 20 satellites, 15 of which are still operational as of this year. Um, it shows Chinese commitment to a stepping stone approach to building their satellite fleet. Uh, they went from a test phase, beta one. Now they're providing coverage for the entire Asia Pacific region. And then with beta three, they moved towards global satellite coverage. So, Moving into modern Beidou. Okay. The last BDS satellite launched on June 23rd of 2020. So it's now finished. Um, it's China's first global navigational satellite system. It, there's a total of 55 satellites in the actual BDS constellation itself. However, overall, China has uh, more than 100 satellites available for GPS applications. Uh, they were created in concert with civilian companies that entered the market in 2014. Prior to that, uh, the satellite industry was strictly under the control of the CCP and government-owned organizations, but they opened it up in 2014. And it's now become a driving force in the annual GDP growth in China as well. Uh, so it's their first fully independent global navigation satellite system. Interestingly enough, uh, China is now offering Beidou as an open system. They advertise that it provides a better overall internet and technological experience for many countries, aimed particularly at Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, obviously, if other countries are economically or militarily dependent on the Beidou network, uh, they're going to be a lot less inclined to anger the Chinese Communist Party, right? So the more countries that actually use Beidou, the more international leverage that China will have. So uh, before we go into the capabilities, um, I do have a caveat to this. Uh, I translated a lot of the ca capabilities from both Chinese scientific journals as well as newspaper articles. Uh, both of these sources have a vested interest in supporting the CCP. So they are not as you know, unbiased as I would like, as they tend to over-exaggerate things. So we will have to take things with a little bit of salt here. Okay. Uh, so first off, obviously, the number of satellites optimizes coverage and redundancy. I've already said you know they have over 100 GPS-capable satellites in orbit at this point in time. Uh, capable of positioning at a sub-centimeter level, they are capable of measurements, timing, wide area differentials, and they are also capable of short message communication services. Militarily, China can now independently guide missiles and bombs for fixed and mobile targets. And these satellites also enable independent military command and control, as well as enable locational data on both friendly and enemy forces in a independent system that's resistant to outside attack. Um, as far as the limiting factors or limb factors of the system, they haven't quite figured out the precise orbit determination yet. That comes from some uh, Chinese scientific articles that I was reading actually only from uh, about a month or two ago. Um, essentially, they said that uh, because they built the system so quickly and put it up in space so quickly, the orbit dynamics of Beto 3 are still in the research stage. So processing strategies are still inconsistent. Um, but as time goes on, they'll improve, and so will their coverage capabilities. 
So moving on from Beto into future um, endeavors for so and the caveat, you know, these come from scientific journals, paper articles, and things like that. They also have a vested interest in CCP approval. So um, China has prioritized the use of artificial intelligence. They are now the leading country for artificial intelligence publications and research passion, patents. Uh, reduces complexity as well as utilization rates. An example of this would be the uh, the Tianzhi 2, which launched in the beginning of this year. Uh, it improved capabilities on um, regular satellites by streamlining the operations. It enabled a more compact size of the satellites. Um, it also increased the ability to upload satellite applications based off of need, and it reduced the work of ground stations regarding the satellite. Um, with other articles I was reading on the use of AI, they are also um, useful for diagnosing navigational satellite issues. So it's reducing the time that a satellite would need to be able to be uh, repaired if anything happened to it in space or there was a problem with the software. Um, there's also uh, AI for image recognition, screening, pre-processing, mission planning, rapid target imaging, and also real-time data acquisition. Uh, one article that I read was talking specifically about AI in the um, in the navigational satellites and stating that uh, China could use it to also recognize patterns and when it should look for certain ships or uh, tanks or whatever it was, uh, that it could find the best angle for viewing those objects and that it could prioritize the data in order to send it back quicker. So AI can also be used to increase military effectiveness by automating attack vectors and surveillance tasking. Um, additionally, China has invested heavily, very, very heavily in facial recognition software for surveillance. And they can also identify and send images utilizing AI in less than two minutes, where it would take up to about 24 hours before. Um, it also enables satellites to continuously move and network attack as well. Increased survivability. Uh, obviously, with over 100 GPS-capable satellites in orbit, they would have to destroy multiple satellites in order to prevent coverage over a very small area. Um, also, AI would help satellites maneuver to avoid physical counterattacks as well as space debris, uh, while also help to prevent network intrusion. Um, one thing that I did find interesting was that most satellites with uh, AI capabilities were also currently in areas of high conflict, such as the South China Seas. Um, concerns with AI is essentially that they are trusting AI with uh, extremely sensitive information. Right. Um, obviously, these are these can be used for military use, um, and that could cause problems if the AI decides incorrectly or highlights the wrong things. Um, it would obviously be a nightmare if Chinese satellite AI decided that a transiting merchant vessel was a threat, or you know that somebody should throw missiles at Filipino fishermen or whatever have you. So Chinese developers are going to have to be very mindful of the sensitive nature of using AI on military platforms. So future prospects, uh, China plans on, you know, continuing working with international allies on satellite development. Um, currently, they have worked with Russia, Germany, and Brazil. Um, funnily, or I guess worryingly enough, uh, they have also utilized American technology by way of a loophole to bypass American statutes that satellite technology was not to be sold to China. Um, in the article I read, when uh, Chinese spokespeople were confronted with proof that China had used a slight loophole to bypass the American laws, uh, China's response was essentially, well, isn't it proof that our great countries can work together, right? Showing that they obviously have no plans to follow it. Um, they have also, uh, in the satellite industry, they have also worked launching satellites for other countries as well. Uh, there is a definitive focus on um, advancing satellite technologies in support of the Chinese Communist Party with the goal of winning the informatiz informatization war, right? 
Um, they have decided that they're going to win this information war by investing heavily in satellite technologies, uh, including AI, obviously, as a primary avenue. And that navigational satellites will continue to be developed as they are critical to military superiority globally and within the region, um, as well as allowing China to project power globally as well. China is focused on pushing the narrative that they're, they're in support of a greater good. Um, obviously, they're still taking opportunities to strengthen their own position, uh, reap the economic benefits, and also improve their own military capabilities. They're using the advances in Chinese satellite technology to show how powerful they are. Um, they're also positioning themselves as perceived saviors of developing countries by offering services to them and ostensibly creating that win-win situation where both entities profit. Uh, this feeds into the Chinese dream of taking their rightful place as a world leader, while also safeguarding their interests at home and consider sovereign territory. Uh, China acts under the idea that the world should cooperate for the benefit of everyone, particularly developing countries, but they are not above acting in their own best while they're doing this. Okay, So that brings my portion to a close, but where I come from, usually when we end a uh, PowerPoint, we have to give the cat tax. So here's my fluffy little kitty, uh, me and my wife's cat, Ashes. So she's a cute little thing, um, but we'll uh, have uh, questions at the end. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Kent Strader, who is going to be going into uh, Russia-China bilateral space cooperation. All right. Let me share. Thank you, Ken. Let me share my screen. Uh... All right. Are you guys seeing my my slides? There it goes. It just popped up. All right. Well, again, good afternoon, colleagues, dignitaries, and guests. And as uh, both Reaper and and Sean said, my name is Kent Strader, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the Space Education Strategic Applications for allowing me to present my non non paper entitled, as you can see, the title there. A Marriage of Convenience, Russia-China Bilateral Space Cooperation. And I'd also like to thank my distinguished colleagues from the American Military University for including me on this panel. It is probably no surprise to this audience, but uh, I would suggest that we are currently observing another space race. Recently, however, I heard an NPR commentator suggest that due to a lack of U.S. domestic support, the race may better be described as a walk. However, 2020, uh, 2023 Pew research suggests differently, finding that 70% of Americans believe it is important that the U.S. remain the world space leader. By space race, however, I am correlating that period in the 1960s, which 20th century historians call the space race, the race that put U.S. astronauts on the moon, which I recall watching on television in 1969 as a mesmerized, mesmerized six-year-old. Yes, I am that old. I remain convinced, however, that Russia and China see themselves very much in a new space race with America. This presentation applies a classical realist lens, conducting a literature review to determine how economic and geopolitical factors influence the trajectory of Russia and China's bilateral space cooperation. The research idea for this study is to explore the substance behind what the Asia News Monitor heralded in 2022 as China and Russia's comprehensive strategic space partnership using classical realism's balance of power and bandwagoning theories, which I'll, exp I'll explain these, this theory here momentarily. The central question that I seek to explore in the few minutes allotted to me asks, does Russia's dependency on China undermine their bilateral space cooperation program? I further hypothesize that while Russia and China's public statements may challenge U.S. space interests, the Sino-Russian space relationship, while outwardly ambitious, is limited by the disparity in the relationship between China's great power status and Russia's bandwagoning. Professor Mark Julien, in his 2022 uh, essay entitled China-Russia's Cooperation in Space, the Reality Behind the Speeches, 
contends that factors such as Russia's declining space budget, the cost of the war in Ukraine, and historic mistrust diminish their ability to effectively rival U.S. space dominance. He further contends Russia and China's space ambitions may be exaggerated. This is not to say that China might not yet rival the United States unilaterally, but this presentation is limited to Russia and China's bilateral space ambitions. However, based on my exploratory research conducted thus far, I contend that Russia's dependency on China makes it difficult to sustain the Russia-China-US multipolarity of space, despite India's recent successes. I will begin the presentation by defining bandwagoning in the context of balance of power. I will proceed to a snapshot of some of the publicly released and official statements, then conduct a brief overview of the contemporary Sino-Russian relations. Subsequently, I will review key factors impacting the relationship, and then in the interest of external validity, I will juxtapose three, the three factors against another key commentator on Russia-China, diplomatic, economic, and military relations. I will end with some conclusions, and then my colleagues and I will entertain your questions. As highlighted in my abstract, my methodology is a literature review and content analysis. The source types I include are scholarly journals, news reporting, official statements, and think tank analysis. All right, on to bandwagoning. So bandwagoning, according to Randall Schweller, is when countries expect to realize gains from riding the coattails of a great power to avoid the cost of balancing. You might recall that Thucydides famously stated in the Melian Dialogue, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Robert Ross agrees with Julian, whom I mentioned earlier, that Russia has become a secondary power to China. Ross, in his 2022 classical realist study, asserts that Russia is a secondary power and China is a great power and depends on China to secure its eastern flank. Most importantly, Ross asserts that Russia bandwagons on China's great power status to avoid security cost. Schweller addresses the question of whether bandwagoning is more common, or excuse me, whether balancing is more common than bandwagoning. While Russia and China have toyed with an alliance, Schweller concludes that they are pre that they have previously viewed it as a competitive game. Russia as a bandwagoner, however, exclusively seeks to be on the winning side. In sum, while Russia continues to bandwagon with China in an attempt to avoid permanent security costs, its ongoing war with NATO proxy Ukraine is allowing China to both exhaust Western conventional military capabilities while extracting Russian technological expertise and natural resources to fuel its economic and industri industrial capacity. According to Julian, Moscow and Beijing accelerated their bilateral space cooperation after Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014, culminating in their 2021 announced joint global sat satellite, uh, excuse me, glo glo global, easy for me to say, global navigation satellite positioning system, lunar exploration, and military space capabilities designed to rival the United States space dominance. According to Luke and Artem, the duo's publicly released statements contend that the two powers have embarked on a new era in Sino-Russian relations. Russia and China have also publicly stated their dual concerns over the weaponization of space and a space arms race, as well as de facto U.S. sovereignty over the moon. Nevertheless, systemic problems plague the relationship. Chinese experts He and Yi point out that Russia's inability to sustain financial support for its space industry and the grain of its space cadre have contributed to Russia falling behind production schedules and maintenance shortfalls at satellite ground stations. The space literature forms a consensus that describes Russia as a junior partner in the relationship. China, on the other hand, is described as a burgeoning great power, while Russia is a secondary power. The nature of the relationship has changed in the past 20 years, with Juing defining this period in two parts, prior to Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014 and the period following. The literature further asserts that the relationship is complex, limited, superficial, lacking depth, yet strong, imagine that, 
commercially oriented and the best in history. So you kind of have those two juxtapositions of what the literature is telling us. In sum, the space literature suggests China is the dominant partner owing to its strong economy and robust industrial capacity, with Russia providing the scientific capacity based on its extensive space history. Setting aside the public statements for a moment, let us explore Julian's three factors impacting the bilateral partners' space ambitions. Florian Videl, in his 2021 essay entitled Russia's Space Policy, The Path of Decline, asserts, and that was a question mark, by the way, asserts that Russian spending on space lags behind the United States and China. In real terms, Russia spends $1.6 billion annually on space on military space programs, whereas the United States spends $18 billion. On the revenue side, Statista reports that Roscosmos saw a decline in revenues from 2018 to 2022, or excuse me, 2020, from 32.27 billion rubles to 17.46 billion rubles. That's a pretty significant uh, drop. Vidal further points out that Russia is losing a critical market for its Soyuz 2 rockets and the MD-80 engines as the U.S. leverages its private space program. Russia is not adapting quickly enough to the advent of private space companies combined with post-2014 sanctions, which have reduced its attractiveness to would-be space customers. In some, my exploratory research suggests Russia's space enterprise is in a desperate need of recapitalization due to an aging space cadre, the lack of access to Western markets, lack of capital investment, and targeted sanctions against its primary income stream, the energy sector. Robert Ross says it best, Russian recession or stagnation is likely to endure for many years, impacting sustained economic growth as well as strong, a strong military. In terms of the war in Ukraine, Artem asserts that the war and Western sanctions against Russia have led to a highly developed exchange economy between the two strategic partners. According to Videl and Julian, Western sanctions have led Roscosmos to utilize Chinese technology and resulted in China receiving full access to Russian space technology and other know-how. Paul Peter et al. in their 2023 study assert Russia appears to be the loser in the partnership as China is set to surpass Russia as a space power. Looking at 2018 de defense spending, Russian defense spending as a percent of GDP is more than double Chinese defense spending, according to Robert Ross. In real terms, Russian defense spending is 11.4% of their overall budget, whereas China's defense spending is 5.5%. Growth rates showed a similar disparity with Russia's annual GDP growth at 2.3% and China's at 6.6%. According to Ross, in 2018, Russia's GDP was 1.7 trillion as compared to China's 13.6 trillion. In sum, Russia's economy is over-reliant on hydrocarbon. Its defense spending is, outsized, is an outsized portion of its annual GDP. This represents a looming cash crisis for Russia's war effort that even China may be unable to avert. Furthermore, as Ross asserts, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has left it a secondary power with no ability to externally balance. Neorealist scholar Stephen Walt has argued only the weakest states bandwagon. All other states participate in balance of power politics, and they prefer to balance against rising powers. Russia does not have that luxury. It is dependent on China for its survival, as well as sustaining its aging space program. Mistrust cannot be qu quantified, but qualitatively, it is a significant factor governing strategic relations. China's growing power relative to Russia, based on international relations theory, means Russia must bandwagon with China to preserve its diminishing power. Russia has been forced by the war in Ukraine to share advanced technologies it once held withheld from China, like its jet aircraft engines, air defense, and space technology. On the Chinese side, space experts Yi and He of Eastern Chinese University asserted that prior to 2014, 
Russia-China space cooperation lacked depth, with the relationship being at a superficial level. Wang Yi and Zhao Gyeon of the China Ac uh, Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology contended the Russian government became increasingly cautious about cooperating with China's space program, mainly for fear of creating a formidable space competitor and also for fear of angering the United States, the most important space partner at the time. In sum, fear of China surpassing Russia has contributed to mistrust between the supposed partners, despite a growing ante. Korolikov asserts that there is no comprehensive framework for assessing military cooperation between the two countries. Showcased on the left of the slide, his study introduces a ladder of military cooperation that assesses military cooperation through three stages, early, moderate, and advanced. His ladder progresses through seven steps from confidence building measures at the lowest rung and common defense policy at the highest. His framework is then applied graphically to, to quantify the development of China-Russia military cooperation since 1991. His analysis shows that since the early 1990s, Russia and China's cooperation has progressed through all seven stages and is now at the highest level of cooperation. As a check on his data, Korolikov examines Russia and China's alignment across not only the military sphere, but the economic and diplomatic spheres as well. His data confirms the convergence between Russia and China diplomatically and economically. Diplomatically, Russia and China have a 99% rate of agreement where out of 120 Security Council votes, China has never sided with the US. Economically, Korolikov confirms a 30% decrease in Russia's external trade and a 40% decrease where, between Russia and the EU because of the war in Ukraine, sanctions, low oil prices, and devaluation of the ruble. Artem confirms that since 2014, Russia has seen exports and, and imports decrease. Conversely, Russia and China trade grew by more than 20% between 2016 and 2017. Artem expands the data aperture to 2019 and asserts that China and Russia's trade grew by 17% from 2014 to 2019. His table enti entitled China-Russia Trade 92 to 2017 shows an overall increase in the total of trade in U.S. dollars from $5.86 billion in 1992 to $84.72 billion in 2017. However, consistent with, Ro with Ross's assertion, the relationship is imbalanced in favor of China. Korolikov concludes that Russia is willing to stomach a higher economic vulnerability and dependency on China. In closing, I would like to look forward in time and prognosticate based on what we know about the past and the present. First, based on Russia's percent of GDP spent on defense, low GDP growth, Current sanctions, its exchange economy with China, the devaluation of the ruble, its aging cadre, its space cadre, that is, and declining space budgets, I believe the strategic space partnership, its ambitions are in peril. Second, now that China has the technological know-how to locally build Soyuz rockets, construct space suits, and launch its own missions, coupled with its manufacturing capability, China may decide to go it alone. None of this accounts for China's current economic woes, of course, but in terms of technology, manufacturing, and command economy, Beijing may decide to shoot for the moon unilaterally. And I think we've seen that from my colleagues. Third, China needs Russia to, to distract the West in Ukraine and absorb as much of our military capability and money as possible while it prepares for rejuvenation. This includes building military capability and capacity to reunify with Taiwan, humiliate Japan, establish hegemony over East Asia, and defeat the U.S. in the Western Pacific. When Russia is no longer useful to Beijing, Moscow should expect to move into a subservient role, much like North Korea. Finally, and perhaps most worrying, based on Moscow's bandwagoning to avoid security costs, I expect that China will will someday annex Siberia through a soft takeover. This will give China full access to vast resources of both Siberia and the high north. 
China will be able to rival U.S. sovereignty over the Bering Strait and have exclusive access to the Northern Sea Route and Northern European ports. With that, I'd like to conclude, and I want to say how much I, um, I appreciate your listening to my presentation, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Kent. Um, so I just wanted to address, we did have one question in the chat from uh, Chapman B asking to what extent is China's uh, geopolitical space strategy influenced by Alfred Thayer Mahan and Julian Corbett's geopolitical sea power thought, as well as Halford McKinder's terrestrial geop geopolitical thought. Um, so I think that as far as space strategy goes, um, space is kind of being looked at as the new ocean, right? So if we uh, look at Mahan and Corbett, uh, they basically feel that supremacy at sea is essential for a nation's political and commercial excess. I think that China still feels that way. Obviously, they're still fighting over the South China Seas. They recognize how important it is. There's a lot of natural resources out there. There's a lot of reasons to try and fight for supremacy at sea which is the whole reason why they're trying to build a blue water Navy, which can go out to the world and project power versus a brown water Navy that has to stay near the coast. I think that they have the same viewpoint towards space strategy as well, that space is the new ocean and that supremacy in the space domain uh, is essential for the nation's political and commercial success. Um, Corbett also went on to say that, you know, he links superiority through numbers and uh, just from what I've seen in the 18 years that I've spent at China or looking at China, um, China kind of believes that uh, quantity is a quality all its own. So the more satellites it puts out, the more technology that it can discover, the more toys that it can have, the better off it's going to be in space. And there's a direct parallel between that and the military. Uh, for example, you know, I believe that our fighter pilots, for example, are better um, pilot to pilot ratio. Uh, than Chinese pilots are. But if China has far more technology and fighter planes at their disposal, then that's going to have a numbers advantage over American fighter pilots. So it's the same kind of concept where that quantity actually comes into play. Um, as far as uh, Mackinder's Geopolitical theory, you know, as far as, you know, ruling East Europe commands the heartland, whoever commands the heartland, commands the world, and that kind of stuff. I'd say that that concept is kind of outdated because right now in the event of globalization and the ability of uh, countries to be able to project power, that's kind of an outdated concept. However, I would posit that if we change the concept of the heartland to be technology, and that whoever controls the technology and being able to advance and whoever uh, controls space and the ability to have that information that's needed, you know, China is always going on about informatization. If we view that as the heartland, then I could agree that, you know, whoever controls that and has superiority in that domain is definitely going to have a leg up on anybody else in the world. Um, so thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Is there anybody uh, with the remaining attendees or panelists that has any questions um, for any one of the panelists for what we presented? Uh, just our thoughts on what we've what we've come together with. Feel free to either throw them in the chat or come up on microphone. I will also say that. Um... You guys should have our emails. We have put them in the chat. And we had them sent out to everybody. If anybody would like copies of any of our presentations or have any future questions or anything that they would like to link up with any of us on, um, you are more than welcome to just send us an email and then we'll send them in to you. Okay, so I'm going to show my ignorance here. Uh, I saw your question, Rabin Napit. Uh, what is PPP? So I'll let my colleagues take a, a crack at that one, and then I'll I'll weigh in. I don't want to talk too much. 
Uh, sir, that's a great question. I, I think if you're looking at that and and tell me if I'm off course here when you're with, with what you're asking, um, if you're talking about what is globally known versus what is di diplomatically or politically known behind the scenes, I think uh, Ken Strader had a, a slide in his presentation where he talked about mutually assured, assured destruction, which is kind of an antiquated idea that if one person has a nukes and launches them, everybody else will. And that's why nobody launches nukes. And I've tried to impress upon the idea that there is a mutually beneficial economy, uh, which kind which Ken kind of talked about a little bit in that publicly we're all against each other and there are, uh, you know, near peer threats. Uh, but di di diplomatically, politically behind the scenes, we are too tied into each other with Russia, China, and the U.S., these economies, that if we let one of those economies fail, it may take down everybody. Uh, namely, that U.S. is one of the biggest exporters of goods from China. So if we let China fail, the U.S. could therefore uh, fail as well. And so I think there's a lot of private partnership between the countries that the public is just not aware of. Um, and that that kind of drives how we advance in space and, and throughout the military. I don't know if that answers the question exactly as you expected it. Okay, so um, I can weigh on this a little bit just as far, not so much in the space commercialization, but I have run into this in terms of like military stuff. So I know how, I'm not sure quite how Russia uh, deals with private public partnership. Um, but I know that uh, for the Chinese, theirs is... Uh, very, very different um, from the U.S. Uh, I would say in a more effective but a more soulless way uh, because everything is still kind of controlled by the government there, right? Especially, you know, they're going to have their hands in. So even if they're allowing um, public uh, entities and industries to actually contribute, they still have to actually have some sort of relationship with the government, right? And uh, for example, uh, one of the ways that uh, they'll work on their missiles, right? In the U.S., generally, if we want a new missile, right, we will um, put out a requirement for a missile. We'll have you know five or six different companies take a look at it. They'll put together their best shot. The big wigs in D.C. will take a look at the plans for all of them. They'll select one, and then the company will basically build it for us, right? So in China, that's different because they actually control them. So when they're actually going to uh, public domains, it'd be more like they'll go to five different companies and they'll say, okay, build us a missile, right? And then all five of the companies will build a missile. And then the Chinese government will go, okay, well, intellectual property rights don't exist. So we want you specifically to build the missile, but we're going to incorporate everything from all the other four different companies, right? So like I said, it's more soulless, but it's, it's definitely efficient. And they've been utilizing it to make some pretty, I would say, impressive advancements in just their weaponry. Um, that's something I have a little bit more experience in is looking at those kind of things as opposed to space commercialization. Surprised if the methodology used for the satellites and space exploration and things like that don't follow the same tact that they do in terms of weapons. I just uh, that's a great point. I was way off, but yes, uh, U.S. I think is following pretty quickly with China, just not the same pace of private public partnership. What you got, Kent? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, you got to remember these are command economies, right? And so they are. Uh, there isn't this the public private partnership that we think of in the United States, as Ken tried to allude to, and and then also remember that these two are very much dependent on one another. Okay, China's already harvested everything it needed from from Russia to be able to advance its space program. At this point now, Russia's in the position where, hey, we need your industrial capacity to help support us to get these Soyuz ro rockets off the ground because we're experiencing all these sanctions. So I don't think there's any kind of a public uh, private partnership really in my mind. I think this is this is all state run and, and I think it's very hierarchical. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you all, but we really need to end this session uh, in order to prepare for the keynote that's happening in uh, nine minutes. 
Um, thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you in the closing keynote by uh, Dr. Arnold Nikogosian at 3.30 p.m. ET. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again, sir. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for listening to us talk. Um, hopefully, we'll see you guys at the uh, the ending. Take care. Thank you.